Hello everyone and welcome to our virtual discovery day focused on the theme of travel just in time for the summer season. Um, so hopefully you all had an opportunity to take part in the poll at the beginning. Um, some interesting results there in terms of who's joining us and in terms of what management you're all on and also those that are in their experiences with holidays and um, whether or not there's been any challenges. Um, and hopefully by coming on to this event we'll be able to alleviate some of those challenges or at least support you in the future with some of those things that you might have faced. So uh, just to introduce myself, um, so my name is Chris and as obviously as well as the host tonight, I'm also the Community uh, Partnerships and Events Lead at JDRF, as well as being part of the amazing community engagement team. I'm also an athlete with type one too. So Following the challenges of the last couple of years, where travel has been understandably difficult for anyone, there seems to be now a bit of a growing appetite amongst members of the community to be back out there traveling again, which is why we wanted to create this online event to help provide people with some reminders, as well as tips and tricks ahead of the summer season of travel. Uh, we know there's a lot to consider whilst traveling with one diabetes, remembering the supplies, uh, traveling through the airport, learning about the food you'll be taking on board at your new destination, as well as also thinking about sometimes the climate and the impact that that might have on you and your insulin requirements. It can seem a lot to manage and think about. So tonight we want to hopefully help break down some of that with some with the support of, um, you know, experiences from our healthcare professionals, as well as those living with type 1 diabetes too. As well as the amazing speakers we have tonight, uh, Lydia, Rachel, Amanda and Beth. You're also going to hear from some of our tech partners as well. So you'll be able to see those on screen. So Air Liquide, Abbott, Dexcom, Medtron and Omnipod are going to be joining us to hopefully help in terms of learning about technology and devices which are currently available as well. There's also going to be an opportunity to ask them questions throughout the session via our Q&A function. And that is what leads me on to the housekeeping for tonight's event as well. So Tonight, obviously, the event is hosted by Zoom. So to help prevent technical difficulties, we recommend keeping all the internet used to a minimum. Your camera and microphone will be automatically turned off so we can't see or hear you. But feel free to use the chat feature and the Q&As to get involved. So my colleague, Helena, is going to be looking after the chat function and she's going to be um, in there as the chat host, renamed in there as JDRF chat host. So feel free to drop in. Uh, into the chat and say hello and let us know where you're watching from. Um, our speakers and our tech partners will also be available to ask questions within it. So just put their name in brackets before the question. So for example, if you were addressing a question to me, you'd put my name in brackets, so Chris. And then for example, you might say, where are you going on holiday this year? So at least then the question is addressed to the person you intended it for. And also please, please be aware that this virtual will be recorded and can be accessed also after tonight, and also a reminder that if you are considering any changes as a result of uh, anything you hear tonight uh, from a tech partner or um, a person living with or healthcare professionals, please do check in with um, your healthcare team prior to making any changes to your own management. We obviously wanted to start with a little bit of background about ARF as well. So we are a type one diabetes research charity funding research to help treat and one day cure type one. We work with the Medical Research Council and the National Institute of Health and Research to make type one diabetes a research priority. Whilst alongside this, we will also work with government departments to demonstrate the impact of type one diabetes in the UK and how this nation can make a difference globally to the condition and finding a cure for it. And then another big part of our role as, as the charity is we involve working with researchers and other funders to create new opportunities for funding, whilst trying to help to alleviate some of the barriers to research progress. Alongside this, then of course, we provide opportunities like tonight to access fantastic range of resources to support people living with type one, as well as their families. We wanna thank all of our speakers that have come along tonight to support, and we hope you will enjoy our evening as much as we enjoyed putting it on. Massive, massive thank you for those that have given up their time to be involved, to our partners for helping to make it happen, as well as all of those that are behind the scenes working hard to ensure that this runs as smoothly as we can make it. 
and then just wanted to demonstrate a little bit for you tonight ahead of the agenda. So an opportunity to look over it. Um, so alongside the four speakers tonight, uh, which is Amanda, Beth, Rachel and Lydia, we'll have presentations from our tech partners. Please note within there the comfort break, which is going to be approximately 7.50. Uh, based on timings and how we run to time, but we will give you 10 minutes there to have a break. And again, approximately, we will finish at about 8.45 p.m. So with that, all of that said and covering off that very first part of our evening, uh, let's kick off with an update for the research team at JDRF about our latest research progress. Yeah, I'm Josie and I'm the research communications lead at JDRF. It's my job to translate the research we fund into something a bit more understandable for everyone. So I'm going to give a brief overview of the research we fund at JDRF and then afterwards I'll share the website link so you can read more about it. First, a quick overview. JDRF is the world's leading type 1 diabetes research charity. Since we were founded in the 1970s, we have funded over £2 billion worth of research into type 1. In fact, we fund the best research wherever it takes place in the world. As you're probably aware, type 1 is a complex condition and there isn't an easy answer to treating or curing it. That's why, right now, we're supporting around 400 research projects and more than 50 clinical trials. In the UK alone, we are currently funding or co-funding more than 30 research projects. Due to the high quality of UK research, JDRF globally spends more on research here than we raise. And with this research, we're improving the lives of people with type 1 until we find a cure. Now, obviously, with 10 minutes, I'm not planning to talk about all 400 research projects. So I've just picked two areas that I think are the most interesting. If you'd like to find out more, you can always check out our website. I'll give you the link at the end. This first bit is all about our work to replace the lost beta cells so you can produce your own insulin again. But before I get into the details, I just wanted to take a step back and explain why we need to do this. So the beta cells are the cells in the pancreas that make insulin. Insulin is what allows the glucose from your food to move from your blood into your cells to give you energy. But in type 1, the immune system comes along and mistakenly kills the beta cells, meaning that you can't make any insulin and the glucose stays in your blood. So the idea behind encapsulation is that you replace the lost cells, putting them inside a protective coating that keeps them safe from the immune system so that they produce insulin once again, allowing the glucose to move out of your blood and into your cells. In that way, it's a bit like a shark cage. The cells are like the scientists here, able to get their work done while they're protected from the sharks or the immune system circling around them. So there's two pieces to this puzzle, growing enough cells for this treatment to be available for everyone who wants and needs it, and finding a way to keep those cells protected from the immune system. For the first part, we fund researchers around the world to find a way to actually grow beta cells in the lab. One of these researchers, Dr. Doug Melton, has had great success in growing thousands of beta cells from stem cells, which are immature cells that can turn into any cell in the body. This is what they look like in reality. His research is now forming the basis of a small early stage clinical trial in the US in people who have debilitating hypos to see if the cells can help them manage their type one more effectively than insulin dosing. So once you've found a way to grow some beta cells, the other piece of the puzzle is surrounding them with the protective material. There's lots of different ways of doing this, but here I'll just look at a couple. At the top, we've got micro encapsulation. Micro meaning really small, uh, like in a microscope. Here, researchers are creating tiny bubbles to put the cells in. And because scientists are endlessly inventive, 
In this case, the bubbles are actually made from a chemical found in seaweed. So you put your cells into little bubbles, and once they're implanted, they can make insulin, safe from the immune system. This is still quite early stage work, so scientists are still working out the best coating and where it's best to implant the cells. But it's a promising route to something that could free you from insulin injections for months or even years at a time. Another way to do this is to think bigger. Rather than fiddling around with lots of individual cells, you put them all together into one device. That's what we've supported this company called Viasite to do. They're developing a capsule around the size of a credit card, which can be filled up with lab grown cells. And as before, this capsule allows nutrients to get to the cells and insulin to leave the cells while stopping the immune system from attacking precious cargo within it. This work is actually a bit further ahead. It's already been tested in clinical trials in the US and initial results have shown the capsule is safe. So it's now a case of making sure that the cells inside can grow and work as they should do. Up next, I'm going to talk a bit about our immunotherapy work, which is a vital part of curing type one. It aims to stop the immune attack at the very heart of the condition. So to explain what immunotherapy is, if we go back to this diagram, immunotherapy would remove the immune system attack. Our beta cells survive and can make insulin. And glucose can be used properly by our body's cells. So how are we doing this? Well, we're funding scientists around the world to retrain the immune system. In type 1, a key cell involved in the immune system's attack is called a T cell. Usually, these are the good guys. They help you fight infections and even stop you getting cancer. But in type 1 diabetes, some of these mistakenly launch an attack on beta cells and kill them. That's why we have researchers working on clinical trials of an immunotherapy called Ustec in Numab. Researchers think this drug may be able to dampen down this immune response. This drug works by stopping the attack signals being sent to T cells, so they're no longer in attack mode. Now, Ustekinumab isn't the only immunotherapy out there. These are just a few of the immunotherapy trials being done here in the UK, with, us, with others soon to launch thanks to the Type 1 Diabetes UK Immunotherapy Consortium, which we co-fund with Diabetes UK. It's bringing together nine universities and 24 research centres across the UK to improve clinical trials of immunotherapies for Type 1 diabetes so that we can find one that works faster. And you can find out more about these trials, including how to take part, on our website here. Most of these are currently being tested in people who are newly diagnosed because it's a lot easier to measure the impact while you still have some beta cells left. But if they're promising, they could form part of a cure alongside a treatment that replaces the lost beta cells. And that would be amazing. Finally, I just wanted to talk about the big research news we shared just last month, the Steve Morgan Foundation Grant Challenge. The Steve Morgan Foundation Grand Challenge is a game-changing partnership between JDRF, Diabetes UK and the Steve Morgan Foundation. Steve Morgan and his wife Sally have been supporting JDRF for many years after their son Hugo was diagnosed with type 1 at 7. Now they've really put their money where their mouths are and have pledged £50 million over the next five years to give a boost to type 1 diabetes research. This is the biggest single donation ever to UK diabetes research, and it means JDRF and Diabetes UK will team up to fund groundbreaking research right here in the UK that will bring us closer than ever to the cures and treatments we all want. How will we decide where all that money goes? Well, we worked with world leading scientists and people with type 1 diabetes to come up with three areas that had the most potential to make a difference. These are Treatments to replace or rescue insulin making beta cells in the pancreas, like encapsulation. Treatments to stop the immune system attack that destroys insulin making beta cells, such
such as immunotherapy. And both of these I've talked about with you today. Finally, next generation insulins, such as those that respond to changing blood glucose levels. Crucially, the money is all committed to new research in these three areas and must come on top of JDRF's existing £14 million research commitments. So it means that all your support is still vital to keep everything we're already funding going, including all the projects I've already mentioned. And because it's focused on those three topics, we'll still need your support for all our other research areas, like combating hypos. This just means that even more research can be done on top of the work everyone is already so generously supporting. And we'll be asking researchers to apply for funding later this year, once we've got everything set up for reviewing their applications. So watch this space as we see what exciting ideas come in. Now, I say until we find a cure, because JDRF have played a role in nearly every major advance in type 1 diabetes research since its founding in the 1970s, so it really is just a matter of time and money. Here, I've picked out a few of the biggest advances of the last 50 years that came from JDRF research. Not long after our founding, our research led to genetically engineered human insulin, which, unlike the animal insulins of the time, could be tweaked to a range of speeds and durations. Before this advance, type 1 diabetes was even more difficult to manage, meaning very regimented diets and daily insulin doses that were more of a best guess situation. Later, JDRF researchers developed an experimental insulin pump, which, as you can see, was not exactly portable. But it set us on a path to the insulin pumps we see today, which can deliver tiny amounts of insulin on demand, as well as those throughout the day, giving much more flexibility to those who can access them. Throughout the 1990s, JDRF scientists pioneered a safe and successful way to transplant insulin-producing beta cells from organ donors into people with type 1, which forms the basis of much of our cure research today. In 2008, a JDRF-funded clinical trial was the first to show that continuous glucose monitoring technology helps prevent dangerous blood glucose highs and lows. This was a big step towards type 1 technology gaining acceptance. In 2014, JDRF researchers developed a way to rapidly convert stem cells into insulin-producing cells in the lab, a vital step towards replacing the lost cells in people with type 1. And in 2019, researchers found that an immunotherapy called teplazumab can delay the development of type 1 by an average of three years. The drug was recently awarded an innovation passport in the UK for its potential to slow or even prevent type 1. Then the very next year, we announced the launch of the world's first licensed artificial pancreas app, built off the back of 13 years of JDRF funded research here in the UK. And finally, in just the last few months, we've learned that the first person has taken part in a clinical trial of a beta cell replacement treatment that's based on the 2014 stem cell breakthrough made possible by JDRF research. So you can see here that the two forms of research are split nicely into that leading to the artificial pancreas and those which lead to beta cell therapies. Uh, some really, really useful insight there on the type one research landscape. And I'm sure many people listening will have taken a lot from that presentation. Um, we're now going to move on to a presentation from one of our partners, uh, Abbott, who produce the Libra flash glucose monitoring system. <laughs> I'm Vicky. I'm um, from Abbott and I'm a medical associate, uh, medical educator associate. So I'm just going to share my screen. This works. 
you see that? Hopefully. Yeah, perfect. So um, I think sometimes we can forget how difficult day-to-day -day life can be for people with living with diabetes. It's 24 hours a day and 365 days a year. Um, being type one myself, I, I feel, you know, I feel exactly the same. And this is where devices, I think like Freestyle Libre system has made a big impact for people living with diabetes. As you saw in the video played earlier, Freestyle Libre has many benefits. It's easy to apply, can be worn up to 14 days. Um, most would agree it's small and discreet and even better that you can scan it through clothes. It's made a lot of people's life a lot easier being able to scan rather than finger prick several times daily. It's got optional alarms and glucose readings are captured every minute, 24 hours a day. Because the readings are captured every minute, the alarm will go off within a minute with your glucose either going too low or too, too high. The home screen that you can see on here, um, that also showed you your past, your present and your future. So it shows you your past eight hour graph, your present current glucose and your future trend arrow. It's easy to read the reports, um, which can help people pinpoint tricky areas where they may be experiencing hypos or areas where they may be too high. This is where um, time in target is great as it gives you percentage time below, time above and time in target. It also has other handy reports like the daily patterns, um, which can help with glucose variability. And it also has lots more um, helpful reports to explore. So that's it from me. Um, I look forward to answering any questions that you may have. Thanks very much, Vicky. And thank you, Abbott, for your support. Now it's a, it gives me great pleasure to be able to welcome Amanda and Bethany to the, um, the event tonight. And they're both passionate healthcare professionals leading on the Diabetes Specialist Network or the DM Forum to many of us in the community. They made a huge contribution to the community throughout the pandemic with their involvement as well in Diabetes 101. Um, all of this while they are day in, day out working in clinics to support people with diabetes. And Amanda also has that personal connection to the condition as well. Um, so I'm going to hand over to both of them and they're going to be sharing their top tips for tackling travel with type 1. So welcome, Amanda and Beth. Hey. Thank you. Cool. So we are Amanda and Beth. Uh, I'm Beth. She's Amanda. <laughs> I'm going to start off. And then we'll, um, I think we've got 20 minutes, which is actually not that long at all to go through travel. So um, we can take questions, but we would definitely advise you sticking to your own DSNs or diabetes team if you do have questions, because it's quite a big topic um, to go through. So obviously we're going to talk about the healthcare professional side of things. Um, and you've got your lived experience people later, which will be a main thing. So our one big top tip. So thinking about before you go, or do you know when you're just planning on going on your holiday, plan ahead. Um, we know that obviously speaking as DSNs and you guys trying to get appointments and things, there's a huge, huge backlog at the moment and we are really, really busy. So, um, oh, sorry, sound is low. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah, fine. Um, yeah, so make sure that you plan ahead, think about where you're going, what the climate's going to be, time zones and things, and do um, get an appointment with your DSN as much um, before you can. Uh, in advance as you can um, so that we can go through all of the bits and pieces with you. Insurance is a must and you must make sure that when you're booking your insurance um, that you get one with pre-existing medical conditions covered already. So you must declare that you have um, DSN stands for Diabetes Specialist Nurse. Sorry, I'm trying to uh, read the chat as well at the same time. Um, make sure you order your spy. So you should be able to order two months worth um and if you need any more um then you can discuss that with your gp and they should be able to give you extra prescriptions um if you are going away i'm sure lydia later will be able to explain a bit more because i know she went on a big long trip um a travel letter so you will need to take a letter um with you which kind of says why you're traveling with your needles and all your consumables and things like that. Just a top tip that GP sometimes will charge you for this letter. So you can get it from your DSN um, and then um, 
they can uh, they will usually give that to you for free so um just a little top tip if you do ask your gp sometimes they will charge you so try, you know don't do that um take a photo of the instance and tech that you use is a really good um tip as well so um keep it on your phone and store it somewhere where you've got it just so that if you are going abroad um or somewhere where you know english they don't speak english for example that they can you have a picture of all the incidents and stuff that you've got we do have people that come to england on holiday um not sure why but we do and it's you know they do have similar incidents over there and um similar incidents but different names so we quite often end up having to google what they've turned up with and stuff so there are um usually similar incidents that we can swap it for and stuff over here but it just helps when we do have some kind of information to go by um talk to the people you are traveling with about your diabetes as well so if you're going with a group of friends that perhaps don't know you've got your diabetes make sure you have those conversations and that you're safe and if things were to happen like unexpected hypos or um dka things like that and you know, um you can be prepared and they're prepared as well oh you can press next slide can't you yeah um so at the airport, this is a question that's already come up in the Q&A, and I know that there was a link put in there about um, what to do about insulin pumps and CGM devices at the airport. Um, but different device manufacturers will have different, um, you know, whether they can go through scanners and whatnot. So you need to look at your specific device and find out if your device is suitable for various things that they do through security, but they shouldn't be making you take it all off and whatnot. Um, so avoid placing your insulin and your diabetes supplies in your check-in bag because how many times have bags gone missing or ended up in a different country and, and, and then you're left without supplies. So always make sure you've got it in your hand luggage and it's either with you, um, with your um, fellow passengers, you know, spread across all the travellers that you have with you um, and keep all your supplies and letters and things at hand in the airport. Cool. So, um, yeah, you can do this one. I was going to say, um, so this is a medical devices card that you can print yourself. And basically it says I have a medical device and um, and it, you know, all the advice that goes with that um, device. Perfect. She's here speaking today, so she can tell you all about how to get that later. Um, so on the aeroplane, so um, you need to think about time zones, which I haven't put all of the information for time zones in here because like i said that is a really much longer conversation you probably want to have with your diabetes team before you go but you need to think about traveling across time zones if you're going long haul obviously if you're just going to benadorm um down the road then you don't need to worry about that so much but flying east to west and west to east sometimes means we have to change your long acting or base length around um so you might just want to have those discussions if you're using mdi so multiple daily injection um we might need to switch things around a little bit or sometimes um, delay it a few hours or whatever um, as it says there think about pressure in the cabin so pressure um, from the aeroplane um, can cause hypo so make sure you have all your hypo supplies with you um, they probably will have some on the aeroplane but it you know might not be enough or you know your preferred choice or whatever it's usually there's probably little cartons of orange juice isn't it so make sure that you've got everything that you need it's quite a good idea as well to split it amongst passengers if you have a few um, passengers with you if you're traveling with other people um, just so that you've got if your bag gets stolen or lost or whatever um, that you do have some um, with you so once you arrive arrive even <laughs> you need to mm -hmm. make sure that you are storing your insulin safely insulin is very susceptible to heat and freezing temperatures so um, you really have to make sure that it doesn't get overheated um, I think is it the next page is, is it going to go tell us about yeah. how to stop that yeah so heat and hot climates cause metabolisms um, to speed up so it can cause insulin to be absorbed faster so be aware of hypos don't leave insulin in the sun because it can spoil um, and then you know you're, uh, that's that's not going to work for you I, I did actually have a patient who came in once who'd left their insulin in a cupboard in a caravan and the temperatures had got up to 40 degrees and this was in the UK um, and then ended up in hospital in DKA and I and we couldn't you know couldn't work out why and then I, I was saying you know what, what, what you know where has your insulin been stored and she said oh in, in back in the caravan <laughs> just like ah. 
mm. chocolate had melted on the side and everything so the insulin does not like the heat um and yeah so if it does happen then don't use it you need to get more supplies and think about using a frio pack or other there are other brands available um but frio pack is basically a, um a, a it's got like water you just you stick it in water and it's got these like crystals in it and as the water um evaporates it keeps the insulin cool and it keeps it cool for a, for quite a few hours and that's good for when you're traveling so if you're going somewhere cooler, um, it's a little bit different. It's kind of similar, but they just have different effects, I suppose. So in colder weather, your insulin is absorbed more slowly at first, but it can be absorbed suddenly when you suddenly then go in from skiing on the mountains down to the nice warm bar and have a hot chocolate or something. Um, so it can get suddenly absorbed then, which can then cause a hypo. So you just need to be a little bit careful about going from that cold weather into the, into the hot um, and also shivering and things like that can also lead to hypos because if you're shivering a lot, you can use up more energy doing that. And again, same similar with heat, you need to be careful in these kind of temperatures that your insulin doesn't freeze. So some people um, might think about storing it uh, in different places like they might store it a, bit, a little bit closer to their body, for example, in their pockets, on their coat, um, in your rucksack. So it's near to your um, body, but it needs to be again, kept in somewhere where the temperature is fairly stable. If it does freeze, again, in the same way as, you know, using it in, in hot conditions, we shouldn't use it and you should start a fresh new batch and throw that old one away. Um, hypos can be more dangerous in cold conditions. Uh, they do interfere with your body's attempt to stay warm and so they can increase the risk of hypothermia which is um, low body temperature so just be careful about all those things if you are going to a hot country um so guarding against hypo is always important but slightly you know again it, it can affect your meters and cgm and things like that and i know um paul coker um had some problems and jerry gore one of our friends isn't it when he was climbing some hideously high mountain um, a little while ago had quite a few problems with getting his uh, reader and CGM and stuff to actually register and work. So just think about maybe having backup blood glucose meters, testing equipment, that kind of thing. Yeah, I think Roddy Riddle's insulin froze on his sort of cross country <laughs> walk um so let's talk about feet so we do need to take care of our feet um if you've ever walked on a sand barefoot which you should not if you have diabetes um but the sand can get very very hot and also there might be stuff in the sand you know people leave rubbish laying around and things and glass and whatnot and we if one when you've had diabetes um for a long time sometimes you can get nerve damage in your feet and so this puts you at risk of treading on things that you you know potentially might not feel straight away um and then you can get blisters and, and things like that so um just never walk around barefoot and that's not just in the sand just in in general you shouldn't walk around bare feet um wearing those new stilettos <laughs> can cause blisters um be aware of rock pools and um, an ocean sharp rocks check your feet for cuts blisters or anything that you're worried about and seek help early um, if you feel that there's something um, not quite right and, and you need some help please do come and see somebody and get that sorted sooner rather than later prevention is much better than cure um, wear sunscreen and sunglasses keep your insulin away from the sun and um, as Beth was saying be aware of those hypos Oh, down at the bar. So we all know that um, alcohol is hugely involved in people's holidays. Um, and so just to be aware that a lot of people um, find that alcohol can cause hypoglycemia and also depending on what you're drinking can cause um, spikes initially when you have your alcohol. Just remember that glucagon, so that injection that you give um, if you're particularly having a, a nasty hypo, which we would hope to avoid, um, but if you do need to have that, it is less effective when you've consumed alcohol. So just be aware of that. Uh, make sure your friends and family are aware that um, if you are out on a, a bender down in whatever it's called, Greece, somewhere in Greece, um, that everyone knows that you do have, um, you know, your type 1 diabetes and it is a little bit of a risk to you. And so you might need to um, stop at the kebab shop on the way home for something to eat before you collapse in bed or collapse on the beach or wherever you may be. Uh, make sure you stay hydrated the next day. 
um, and remember that your CGM sensors, they do rely, um, you know, on fairly well hydrated skin to work a little bit better for you. So just, you know, that's why it's important to stay hydrated the next day when you will be a little bit more dehydrated from all the alcohol. Absolutely. And those risk of hypos can go on all through the next day as well, if you've had a particularly heavy night. Um, so holiday activities. Uh, quite often when we go away, uh, we increase our activity. I went to Cornwall uh, a couple of weeks ago and I was doing well over 18,000 steps a day, whereas I'd used to being in the office and sitting down and doing nothing. So I was hypo central pretty much the whole week. Um, sightseeing, honeymoon sex, <laughs> uh, skiing, paddle boarding, Zumba classes, you know, all, all those kind of things will increase the risk of hypos. Um, or if you're having a nice laid back, relaxing uh, pool with a book, um, you might even need more insulin um, if you're if you're decreased your activity, if you're used to being quite running around at work and now we're sitting by the pool not doing anything. Um, there'll be changes to diet. Um, you won't be, um, unless you're self-catering and doing really, really good and cooking it all yourself. And it's exactly as you would more often than not, you'll be eating out and having meals and things. And so um, there may be some adjustments need to your bolus doses of insulin. Um, and then think about injection sites. Um, you'll be wearing clothing with make skin more or less accessible. So if you've got a big snowsuit on, where are you gonna inject? You need to kind of think about that. Um, and if, if you change injection sites because of what you're wearing, the risk is that you could be, um, insulin could absorb better because we, we do tend to inject in similar spots. We shouldn't do it, but we do do it because it's easy and it's there and, and it does, uh, you know, it, it, it is easy. Um, um, but if we've, we do that, you can develop um, sort of scar tissue, lipo, lipos, they call them. Um, and if we then suddenly move our injection site to somewhere else, the absorption can be a lot better, which then can lead to hypos. So just be really careful if you're changing injection sites due to um, clothes that you're wearing. And use tech. We love, we love a bit of tech. <laughs> Cool. So again, that's a lot about hyperinflation. This is the opposite. So DKA. So just be aware, um, you know, if you do go for a dodgy curry or you do come down with some dengue fever or some bug when you're in somewhere exotic, just be careful. Uh, they are slightly more common in hot weather. Um, remember to stay hydrated and remember your six day rules. Maybe take a photo and keep a copy of it on your phone so you've got it just in case you need it. And again, you know, give your friends and family or whoever you're traveling with a copy just in case. Uh, when you're poorly, you still need to take your insulin. So, you know, it's all that stuff that we were, us DSNs, were bleating on about during COVID. You mustn't ever stop taking your insulin. And actually, when you're poorly, you tend to need more insulin rather than less, even if you're not eating and drinking. So just be a little bit careful. Um, and make sure that you follow the, the sick day rules that, that we kind of go on about all the time. Uh, if you are taking metformin as well, which some people for type 1 diabetes do, um, you must stop taking that during acute illness because it can actually cause some problems with your kidneys. So if you are prescribed metformin, just make sure that you do stop that whilst you are acutely unwell. So, you know, in that in that couple of days where you're being sick or having that diarrhea and just make sure that you um, restart it again after you've been eating and drinking or feeling better for about 48 hours. There's a few contact numbers that you might want to take a photo of um, companies if you're abroad and you need help from any of your insulin companies. So Lily, make all of the insulins like Humalog, um, anything beginning with H really, isn't it? Humalog, <laughs> Humalog Mix, Humalin I, they, they, they like to confuse us naming everything quite similar. And Nova Nordisk do things like Nova Rapid, Levermere, um, and Sanofi do uh, Lantus, um, um, I'm not sure <laughs> what other ones. Um, uh, which, which a they do yeah, a PJ. Yeah. yeah. What's the last one there? What cart does? I mean, it's quite old fashioned, is it? It's like the beef and pork insulin, but um, okay. some people still do, do take that, but that's um, the porcine insulin. Cool. And if you've got um, 
tech like an insulin pump um there will be a advice line each each company will have an advice line um for their product um especially we i had a a person who got stuck um in another country and had a bag stolen and all of her uh, device um all of her consumables for her pump were were stolen in her bag um and we we were able to get hold of the medtronic rep in that in that country and, and get her some new supplies so that she didn't have to go back onto pens which was really lucky for her um yeah and i think that to our time i'm not sure um, yeah. <laughs> we have about any question? I think there's some questions in the Q and A, but I'm not sure if they're all for us. There's one about why um, why does the pressure in an airplane cause hypos? Um, I'm no physicist, but it's got some it's got something to do with the um, partial pressure of oxygen in the cabin, I guess, that can cause the hypoglycemia. Um, well, hopefully, hopefully you can both. Know what the answer is. That's all right. Well, hopefully you can both drop into the chat and have a little look over the the questions if you yeah. you've got a few minutes anyway, and, and see what you can what you can and you can't answer. But thank you both for a, a brilliant presentation, really insightful. Some great tips in there for all of us to learn from. I certainly picked up a few things that I'd forgotten, and some reminders, which I'm sure many that have joined us tonight will have will have done as well. Um, thank you. So thank you for joining us. Um, we're now going to move over to a presentation from Air Liquid, who distribute the Tandem T-Slim pump. So welcome, Air Liquid. Hi, um, thank you, everybody. Um, yes, my name's Sarah Summers, um, and I'm just here to tell you a couple of quick things about the T-Slim insulin pump. Sorry, my slides have decided not to work. So the T-Slim um, is a touchscreen interface. It can be updated with software throughout the four year life cycle. So that can be done remotely from home via an online portal. The T-Slim links to the Dexcom G6 continual glucose monitor. And um, so that means that you can access two different algorithms if you have the continual glucose monitoring link. That is our basal IQ algorithm, which is a low glucose suspend. And then we also have control IQ which is our advanced hybrid closed loop system. So if you have the T-Slim pump with Dexcom, the pump has the ability to predict the glucose value 30 minutes in the future. It can adjust the basal insulin and it also has the ability to give automatic correction boluses as well. It's a rechargeable battery. Um, so yes, myself and my colleague Summer, we're here to take any questions that you may possibly have in relation to the T-Slim and obviously any kind of like specific travel related questions um, regarding the T-Slim if you have any of those to ask as well. So I think that's my two minutes. Perfect. Thanks very much, Sarah. Thank you for that. Um, so now we're going to move on to um, a presentation from another person with a lived experience living with, um, with type 1 diabetes. So Rachel Crawford, who's going to be joining us now, is a passionate member of the diabetes community, campaigning for improved support and awareness for type 1 diabetes within airports. Following what was a challenging experience at an airport security she'd had with her son, who lives with type 1. I'm not going to steal any of her thunder, so I'm going to let her tell you all about what she's already done what she's working on and how she's helping to improve type one experiences in airports. So uh, it's a real pleasure to have you, Rachel. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Chris. Um, first of all, well, good evening, everyone. Um, I am a mum and I'm not a public speaker, so please bear with me. Um, that said, I am really pleased to have been asked to take part in this travel and holiday special. And thank you to JDRF and the organisers for inviting me. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so my son George was diagnosed type 1 when he was nine years old and he started on MDI therapy, as many children do. When he reached 13, we were given an insulin pump by the Royal Surrey Hospital in Guildford. He also made it to Westminster to campaign for better availability of medical technology for other patients. 
The pump gave us flexibility and we were able to go on some fun overseas adventures like road trips through Death Valley, hiking, zip lining between two mountains in Canada, paragliding and white water rafting. It also allowed for regular martial arts training without blood sugars getting in the way too much. And also trips to Vegas and New York to see some UFC fights where the excitement of course led to lots of temporary basils. Hospitals and insulin pump manufacturers advised that the radiation used by x-ray screening for luggage and the full body airport scanners may interfere with the motors of pumps resulting in a potential impact on insulin delivery. In 2016, I wrote an open letter to, Di to Dubai Airport after my family were held in an airport police room for over two hours. We were denied access to an aircraft because of George's insulin pump. This slide shows airport officials reading my letter. We were eventually able to travel, but when I returned to the UK, I looked into the protocols in place for medical devices and the regulations do allow for alternative security screening. So I started a campaign to raise awareness and also looked into how to ensure that our experiences were not repeated. The campaign quickly gained support and I spoke with pump manufacturers, key NHS staff and the security departments at UK airports, as well as the Civilization Authority and the Department for Transport. I also contacted the head of security at ACI World, who in turn published a supportive article in their World Report. And this was sent to members operating in over 1800 airports in more than 170 countries. However, I was still receiving messages from people all over the world having terrible experiences, including accounts of pumps failing when forced to go through the x-ray machines and scanners. It was evident that the security officers were often unaware of the actual procedures and this was affecting hundreds of travelers. In December 2018, I met with Peter Drissel, Director of Aviation Security, and Michael Lee, the Head of Airports Regulation at the UK Civil Aviation Authority. We started working together on a medical device awareness card as a practical solution to cover insulin pumps, CGMs, and the Freestyle Libre. The card was officially launched with full backing from the government in early 2019, just in time for her half term, um, the card has information on one side for security officers and for the passenger on the other. It proved to be a hit, and from a personal point of view, it means that my son has the freedom to travel without his lioness mother. The same goes for other young people, especially when on overseas uh, school trips, etc. It was around this time that JDRF kindly offered to host details of the campaign on their website. This enabled us to have a home for all of our information, including a link to the card, this news section and tips for travel. For details, please go to the jdrf.org.uk forward slash air security. However, this was all still just for the UK and of course it is a global problem. After further discussions with the CAA and the Department of Transport, the card scheme was presented in early 2020 at an ICAO meeting which is a specialized agency of the United Nations. The card proposal was endorsed by their aviation security panel and included in their security manual, which is widely used by authorities around the world and contains a template for the card. Since then, COVID happened. Um, there have been some changes at airports with regards to health measures put in place to protect passengers and staff. However, we have been assured that the process for screening passengers with medical devices remains the same. To be clear, the guidance is that insulin pumps must not be either screened by x-ray or passed through the security scanner and other screening methods are available as before. Uh, we recommend that the MDA card continues to be used and that medical confirmation of devices and medication is carried. My aim now is to continue raising awareness to achieve the goal of all insulin users having a stress-free and most importantly, a safe experience at airport security around the world. Part of my association with the Civil Aviation Authority is to inform them of any negative experiences so that they can contact the relevant airports. So please do let me know if that applies to you. I can be contacted on rachel at mdacard.com and we'll need the date and the time of the incident, as well as the airport. Um, and of course, we also do love to hear a positive experience of using the car too.
For more details, please go to the JDRF website or to ndacard.com. So that is it from me. Um, and I will be available in the Q&A section if you do have any questions, I'll do my best to help. Um, and of course, I will select my email address. Okay, thank you, Chris. Thank you so much, Rachel, for joining us and for uh, giving us such a great insight there, your experiences and the work that you've been doing to, to support all of us in the type 1 diabetes community. So really appreciate you joining us this evening. Um, we're now going to move on to a presentation from Dexcom. The Dexcom difference that we love is that you don't have to scan your sensor to get your diabetes updates. They get sent straight to your phone, just like your social media updates do. I find that when I go into exams, my uh, glucose levels can go off the rails a bit and the interconnectivity between my Dexcom G6 and my pump means that I spend more time studying and less time worried about my glucose levels. The Dexcom difference for me was I once did a 53 mile ultra marathon, 18 miles into the 53 mile race, my cannula ripped off from my insulin pump. Having the, the Dexcom G6 trend arrows meant that I could just keep an eye on the trend arrows to get me through the race. I have the confidence to dash from place to place and to stand on stage and perform safely in the knowledge that my G6 is right there on my watch. Overall, I now feel like my diabetes comes along for the ride with me rather than it being the other way around. I like the Dexcom follow app because it allows me to see what Jack's up to, his glucose levels are doing all of the time, wherever he is. Hi guys, uh, my name's Luke Webb from Dexcom. Um, just following on from the video that just played, um, a quick reminder of what, what we do at Dexcom. We aim to find and improve diabetes management with our continuous glucose monitors, uh, also known as CGMs. Um, they simply send real-time glucose readings to your smartphone or device. Um, so you know where your glucose is heading and how fast um, with a quick glance. Just on today's theme, I know there's been some questions in the chat, which I'll get around to answering, but Dexcom um, CGM is a great travel companion and shouldn't cause you any issues going through airports. There's a couple of things to be aware of, um, but I will pop uh, some links, a couple of links in the chat uh, with a summary with all the information you need to know, but uh, really simple. My, my partner's type one, I've traveled with her countless times, I mean, absolutely fine. Um, but as I said, I'll get around to those questions and pop them in the chat. Um, more than happy to answer any other questions in the question and answer. Um, and yeah, www.dexcom.com for any, um, any information or to stay up to date with what's going to be an exciting rest of 2022. Thank you. Cheers, Luke. And thank you, Dexcom, for your support. Um, you'll have 10 minutes now to get yourself a quick cuppa or whatever drink you're after or any snacks that you might be wanting, uh, hopefully treat any hypos if they've occurred as well. Um, but in that meantime, they should be able to see a QR code on the screen. So um, if you just open up your camera and then scan it over the QR code, um, you'll be able to find the link then to support JDRF. So yeah, have a little look over the QR code, grab yourself 10 minutes, and we'll see you back in a little while. Welcome back, everyone. Hope you've managed to grab yourself a drink and some refreshments and you're ready and raring for the second half tonight. Um, we're now going to be joined by our third speaker of the evening, so Lydia Parkhurst. Lydia is a secondary school geography teacher and a well-known social media personality running the Type 1 Diabetes and Travel account, The Backpacker and The Pub. Since her diagnosis 12 years ago, Lydia has been raising awareness of type 1 diabetes through lobbying in Parliament, meeting members of the royal family and speaking at international diabetes conferences, conferences throughout the world. But we've persuaded her to come and share her story with us tonight. So welcome to the event, Lydia. Thank you for joining us. Hello, two seconds. Let me just share my screen with you all. Okay. So when you get diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, you're often told that the condition doesn't stop you from doing anything. But sometimes it's hard to believe this, especially when the people telling you don't often live with diabetes. So hi, I'm Lydia. I'm a secondary school geography teacher and I've been diagnosed with type 1 diabetes for 12 years. And as Chris said, you may know me online as the backpacker and the pod. 
So today I'm hoping to provide you with some knowledge about travel and type one and hopefully tell you a few stories along the way. So as an 18 year old with my backpack on my back and my Omnipod on my arm, I set off on my biggest adventure, traveling by train around Europe with my best friends. We had been planning this for months, looking at different routes, different hostels, and the sites we wanted to see. However, my planning didn't finish there. I also had to plan for type one diabetes too. As well as navigating our way around seven countries, I also had to navigate the unknown of backpacking with type one diabetes. My team gave me some great advice. However, there was very limited information out on the internet from anybody with type one diabetes who had been traveling. So I packed my bags ready to learn as I traveled and the unknown of my blood sugars Okay, reacting in different situations it did make me a little bit nervous, but I knew it was something that I really wanted to do and I was prepared as I could be. I'd just like to thank my mum, dad and sister for giving me their support because without it, I don't think I would have had the confidence to go and live my dream. So what I wanted to do was I wanted to find ways to manage type 1 diabetes so that I could provide information for other people. So I often get asked, how do you pack with T1D? So I use a formula, I times by two, divide and spare. It sounds like a maths equation, so let me explain. So times by two, so I take twice as much insulin and supplies than I would normally need, plus a few more. If you normally have five test strips a day, plan for 10, take double the amount of pods, pump supplies, insulin pens, etc. It's always better to have it with you. You don't know if your flight's going to be delayed or your sun cream will, and hot weather will unstick your cannula. The next one is divide. So I split my medication and supplies into different bags and you can always have to keep your medication in your hand luggage. Lots of airlines, if you've been prior to the flights, will allow you to have an extra bag for your medication. So I carried all my medicine in a small rucksack through the airport to Poland on for the start of my in-trailing trip. Keeping my insulin and other medication in my hand luggage stopped it from getting broken and the panic if your hold bag goes missing. It's also worth noting that goods in the hold of a plane can freeze and frozen insulin is no good. So never put any of your insulin in the hold of a plane. I was really lucky that my friends were so supportive and they helped to split and carry my medicine around Europe for me once we went backpacking. I was therefore able to have cannulas in each of their backpacks along with spare blood sugar handsets and a FIO pack filled with insulin. If something was to happen to my bag, I knew I'd still be able to carry on with the trip. So the next part of the equation is spare. So along with pods, FIO packs, my insulin vials and everything else that goes along with T1D, so strips, batteries, glucose tablets, lancets, I brought a spare glucose handset and keto machine and a spare Omnipod holiday handset, which was a lifesaver if something was to go wrong. I also took um, the handset in case the pod got, um, in case the handset got thrown off a cliff or sunk into the bottom of the lake. Thankfully, I didn't have to use any of these, but if they weren't packed, I would have needed them. So along with packing my supplies, I packed a folder full of documents. So this included my passport, diabetes information, so things like carbohydrate ratios, background insulin, emergency telephone numbers for my family, my nurse, um, for Omnipod, for um, my GP, just in case anything was to happen and I was to lose my phone. I asked my language teachers at school at the time to translate this, um, this letter for me in case going through airport scanners became a problem. This was really useful to have an addition to my GP and diabetes specialist nurse letter. Nowadays, with data roaming that doesn't cost a fortune, you can even use Translate on your phone to help you with these letters at the airport. Make sure you have a backup though in case your phone dies. So I took my translated letter with me to any attractions I visited in case they used scanners too, and it made life so much easier instead of trying to play charades or saying like pacemaker, which usually does a trick even though it's not quite the same. The difference in knowledge and understanding though, since my first in-trailing trip to recently is brilliant, especially in the UK. At the time I went traveling, the security in Amsterdam had never seen an Omnipod. Um, I had one or two experiences abroad where the lack of understanding with, from diabetes and the language barriers did cause a little bit of an issue. However, after showing my letters, a little game of charades, 
and eventually a member of airport staff who had seen an insulin pump, I'd be on my way. So there's always so many opportunities to educate people about type 1 diabetes because you don't know who that's going to help next. So making my way through airport security, we boarded our flight to Poland, which was the first stop on our interrailing journey. Alarms helped me get into a good routine when I started my trip. Arriving in Poland, I changed my insulin pump clock due to the time zone, and I set alarms on my phone to test. And although sometimes it wasn't convenient to test at that time, for example, on the metro in France, or squished on an overnight train in Slovenia, it helped me to keep a closer eye on my bloods, which was needed in such varying environments. So making our way through Europe on the train, we travelled to Austria, visiting Salzburg and Innsbruck. We arrived at our hospital in Salzburg after a long day exploring and we decided to go and grab a drink at the hostel bar downstairs. I asked the bartender for a Diet Coke. If you know me, you know I can't live without it. I was gutted when he told me that we'd just run out. The barman asked me about my Omnipod. He seemed to know about insulin pumps, but he said he'd not seen a patch pump before like mine. I sat back at my table, gutted that there was no Diet Coke left, playing cards with my friend, and the bartender went into the stock room. He ran across with the last Diet Coke. He started chatting to us and he began to ask me again about my insulin pump. You're sweet enough already, he joked. And that was the first time somebody had ever used diabetes as a chat up line. So traveling in Slovenia, I was completely in awe. I was surrounded by glacial lakes, gorges and beautiful scenery. We stayed at a hostel within walking distance from Lake Bled the most stunning place I have ever had the opportunity to visit. Whilst booking in, the man asked me what was on my arm. And again, I explained. It turns out one of his family members had type one. And this conversation led to a lady working there telling me she was a dietitian. It's always a nice feeling to know others know about type one if something was to go wrong. Staying at hostels though means you meet lots of other backpackers. We joined our hostel in a hike up to the top of the hill surrounding the lake before heading back down and rowing it across to the church in the middle of the lake. My top tip would be to keep quick medication like glucose tabs and CGM regions or finger prick testers in a bum bag. It's so handy and it means that you don't really have to accommodate for your diabetes. In cities, I was less likely to get pickpocketed than having them in my rucksack, so it made me feel a lot more confident. I only took out spares that I may have needed for the day, but just make sure that if you do this, you lock the rest of them away in a hostel locker. Back on our travels again, we headed to Italy. It has to be one of my favourite countries. We travelled to Venice, Pisa and Rome. And although Pisa may have a piece of my heart, it definitely does not have my pancreases. As every time I went to see a famous landmark, such as a leaning tower of Pisa, my blood sugars went low. Heat for many people makes their blood sugars drop. However, for me, it seems to be a bit different. It seems to make them rise a little bit. But with the amount of walking we were doing and the heat, my blood sugars seem to counteract each other. Having an insulin pump and being able to use temporary basal rates were really important to me. Although I couldn't set temporary basal rates for certain times each day because my hypos didn't have a pattern, I was able to reduce my insulin when my blood levels started to drop. or um, So it either stopped or reduced the low and it enabled me to carry on taking selfies. I gained so much confidence on the trip in terms of managing my diabetes in unknown situations. So that's when I decided to set up the backpacker in the pod to share my stories to let people know that we can travel with type one. So my next adventure took me to Hong Kong. As part of my university course, I was given the opportunity to travel to Hong Kong to complete some field work. This was the furthest I'd ever traveled with type one. With different food, climate and exercise, I wasn't sure how it was going to affect my diabetes. Whilst in Hong Kong, we visited temples. I ran around literally with my camera, taking photos of the amazing parades. And I studied the lives of locals and the impact of tourism on the area. During our time off, we hiked up Victoria Peak and Dragon's Back Mountain with my friends. To get to Dragon's Back Mountain, we had to travel up a little windy mountain side road. After hiking to the top of Dragon's Back, we made our way back down to find a beautiful cove. Here, we decided we'd go for a quick swim. After hiking in the heat and swimming, I thought I'd done a really good job of controlling my blood sugar levels. For the hike, I did, and then the unplanned swim threw me into a low. 
This was made so much better though by strawberry Dextron, uh, Dextro tablets. But I wouldn't change the memories for the world. Sometimes you have to accept that the low you could have had, it could have been from something boring, such as hoovering at home. If you've heard one of my speeches before, you'll know how difficult I can find it um, managing my blood sugar levels when I go walking. For as long as I can remember, I've always wanted to complete my Duke of Edinburgh. Throughout my time in secondary school, I completed my Silver Duke of Edinburgh. I had a few lows on my expedition, walking with a 12 kilogram rucksack on your back for 12 miles a day for three days I was bound to. However, same as everybody else, I completed it. The next challenge was Gold D of E. Day three into our four day practice walk and I was exhausted. Wanting to be independent, I carried small cans of Sprite in my rucksack for when I went low. Dextro tablets and other high po treatments didn't bring my sugars up quick enough. I put on temporary basal rates to lower the amount of insulin going through my background levels. I didn't inject for my meals. I ate carb snacks. I was doing everything that I'd been taught to do. After turning my insulin off, I was still having around six high pays a day. My rucksack weighed 15 kilograms. We were walking 16 to 17 miles a day up steep terrain and having low blood sugars for all this time drained me. The last day I told my DV leader, I couldn't have another day of low blood sugars like the previous days. So we emptied my rucksack and without carrying the extra weight and having no insulin going in, we managed to keep my blood sugars in range. My teachers were fab, but you could tell it concerned them and it concerned me. After saying my diabetes would never get in my way and never letting it get in my way, this time it had. I didn't feel as though I could celebrate when I got to the end of the practice walk because I didn't fully carry all of my kit. In reality, I was too hard on myself, but in a way, I'm glad I was. But I wasn't gonna give up on DV now. You only have to tell me I can't do something to make me do it. So I went back to my diabetes team and we spoke about my levels and what we could do. We decided to put my pump on a very low basal again, and this time my team lent me a continuous glucose monitor. This allowed me to carry on with DV and my team to see what my blood sugars were doing. The digital safety of having a CGM when I realised I couldn't work out what my body was doing was fantastic. And only then I realised that I'd been walking around in the dark. I carried my rucksack full with all my equipment, but this time my camel pack, which was filled with water, was now filled with isotopic sports drinks. Every day I'd fill up my camel pack from the leader's van, allowing me to sip on the drink throughout the day to keep my blood sugars level. It just shows that because something is difficult, you should never give up. There is always a way to work around it. So last weekend, my boyfriend and I travelled to Wales, as you can see in the picture below on the right hand side of your screen. We hiked up Snowdon and I only had one minor low. At the top of Snowdon, um, a guy with his group of friends offered to take a photo of me and James, my boyfriend, at the summit. His friend spotted my CGM. He said, I'm tight one too. And he pulled a fish sleeve to show me his Libra. It just shows that people with type 1 can do anything we put our mind to. Keep working towards that goal. So one of my favourite type 1 travel memories comes from Travel Monday in Germany. So walking down the street with my lever on the back of one arm and my Omnipod on the back of my other arm, I was chatting to my friends when a teenage boy, a similar age to myself at the time, tapped me on my lever. So I turned round to see him holding the lever handset. I immediately panicked and I thought I dropped my handset, frantically feeling my bum bag, and I pulled out my own lever handset. All of a sudden, I was seeing double. He was tight one as well, and he was trying to show me his lever. Despite the language barrier, we chatted about the lever and we took a photo, which you can see in the middle of the screen. So putting on my backpack again and jumping this time into a car, and then a train, and then another train, and then a plane, a plane, on a plane, I finally made my way solo to Singapore, where I was meeting my best friend from university. After exploring Singapore, we hopped, and you guessed it, onto another plane. We began travelling up Thailand with our friend from, other friend from university. We travelled up to the mountains in Chiang Mai on a tuk-tuk to visit the most beautiful golden temples and meet the colourful hill tribe known as the Long Neck Karen tribe, who you can see on the screen. The humidity and downpours we experienced in Thailand did not fare well for my diabetes tech. We had to pop into a pharmacy and buy a bandage to tie my tech on. Next time, I'll be taking skin tack wipes.
Whilst visiting Chiang Mai, we researched ethical elephant sanctuaries, and although it's very difficult to find them, we believe we found one, where the elephants have been rescued from a circus and given a better life. This elephant sanctuary does not allow you to ride the elephants. At lunchtime, after feeding and bathing the elephants, we were invited to sit down for lunch. The owner passed me a bowl. My friend had written on the form that I had type 1 diabetes, so I was given a salad for lunch. It was incredibly sweet of them, but it did make me want to laugh. On my way home, I was sat in the airport waiting to come back and a little girl approached me. I could see her mum was watching from afar. She smiled and I smiled back. Her daughter then pulled out an insulin pump. Her mum said she had spotted me and wanted to come and say hello and they'd seen my blog before. Meeting with type, people with type 1 really is the strangest thing. So Iceland is a place I've always wanted to visit. However, I wasn't sure how easy it was going to be to travel there as my blood sugars dropped really low in the cold. From hiking next to waterfalls to freezing to the course, watching the Northern Lights, it was one of the most fantastic places. Can you tell I'm a geography teacher yet? With lots of snacks and the privilege of having an insulin pump and a CGM, my diabetes management became so much easier, meaning that I could make informed decisions. Diabetes has given me the opportunity to raise awareness on an international level, and I've met some incredible people. I've had the amazing opportunity to meet Theresa May, who also has type one, when she was serving as Prime Minister, serving as Prime Minister the leader of the opposition at the time, Ed Miliband, and I have met Her Royal Highness, the Duchess of Cornwall. I have been incredibly lucky to travel around the world telling my story of my life with type one, traveling from South Korea to speak at the, one of the largest diabetes conferences in the world, to participate in round tables for companies such as The Guardian, to raise awareness and support for young people. So my takeaway for you today is not to let diabetes get in the way of doing anything. Yes, it is more inconvenient testing, and so is hypoing in the middle of a metro, carrying a 65 litre rucksack and a day pack, but you can do it. I did it, and it's a challenge, but at the end of the day, you only live your life at the end of your comfort zone. And we can do anything else, anything anyone else can do, just with type 1 diabetes. I would definitely recommend getting a medical alert bracelet for travelling, as it put my mind so much more at ease if I had a problem that someone would know, have a better idea and know what to do and why. It's such an amazing experience going traveling and I hope what I've learned will help you too. Wow, amazing Lydia. Thank you so much for sharing those stories with us. Um, some brilliant ones in there and so much we can all learn from your experiences. So really, really appreciate you dropping on tonight to, to share all that with us. Um, we're now going to move on to a video from Insulet, who produced the Omnipod. So joining us is Insulet. Simplify your life with pod therapy. The Omnipod Dash insulin management system is simple and discreet, consisting of just two primary parts, a tubeless waterproof pod, and a touchscreen personal diabetes manager, known as the PDM. Simplicity is just the start of it. The Omnipod Dash Pod is discreet, lightweight, tubeless and waterproof, and can provide up to 72 hours of continuous insulin delivery. It contains a small, flexible cannula that inserts automatically. You'll never see it and barely feel it. The pod can be worn anywhere insulin would usually be injected and allows you to free yourself from daily injections, tubing and wardrobe compromises. You can stay connected to your basal insulin delivery and your favourite activities. Run, swim, play and simply enjoy life. All controlled with a few finger taps from the convenient Omnipod Dash PDM. The Omnipod Dash PDM is discreet, intuitive and easy to use. With familiar smartphone-like technology, just tap a few buttons on the Omnipod Dash PDM and your bolus insulin is delivered. And with a built-in bolus calculator, you can spend less time on maths and more time enjoying meals, more time enjoying exercise, more time with friends and family, more time just being you. The Omnipod Dash system gives you the freedom to live your life. 
For more information, please speak to your healthcare professional. Thank you, Intellect, for joining us tonight and the support in providing the event as well. Um, next up in the schedule and on tonight's agenda is a presentation from our very own Adele Irwin around the ways in which JDRF provide community support. So welcome, Adele. Hi, I'm Adele from our community engagement team here in JDRF. And I have the great task of talking to you today about some of our information and support services that JDRF offer, our input advice service and technology exhibitions, our virtual and in-person events, and some of the opportunities to get involved that you may be interested in too. The JDRF community engagement team are here to support the type 1 community. We have resources to help support those newly diagnosed, both for adults and children. Newly diagnosed children can get a free kid sack, which includes Rufus, the bear with type 1 diabetes. He has special patches to show where his injection sites are. The pack also includes a handy kit bag and leaflets and further information to support you through the condition. Our latest Rufus bears are even made from 100% recycled materials. Newly diagnosed adults can avail of our adult toolkits, including straight to the point book. And our free school pack includes facts about type one, how to manage hypos and hypers, and a parent's guide, including useful things to think about when inviting a child with type 1 round to play or for tea or a sleepover. We also have new other new resources such as the new publications, a new type 1 diagnosis and helping others to understand type 1. Our discovery days provide a face-to-face -face element for peer support. JDRF also supports the Type 1 community in lots of other ways. We have a website full of information for people living with Type 1, which is constantly updated. We keep in contact with the community through our Discovery magazine and e-news. As well as our virtual and in-person community events, we have information and packs for newly diagnosed or for anyone who reaches out, such as Pregnancy Toolkit, Type 1 Tech, work in university. We also have our input service. Input was formed back in the late 1990s and merged with JDRF back in October 2018. Input offer trusted information about access to technology, which is regularly updated and relevant for the four nations of the UK. They offer key insight through our involvement with key groups and networks, healthcare professionals, medtech partners, and the lived experience of people with type 1. Input offer advice, that's specific one-to-one -one advice about individual cases and access to tech. People contact us with questions such as the ones included on this slide. We have in-person and virtual speaker events and virtual fusion events for both children, young people and adults. We have standalone technology exhibitions and our in-person discovery days and sports days are a great way to meet other people and share information about living with type 1. Having technology exhibitions at our in-person discovery days have enabled the community to see and feel the diabetes devices potentially available to them. It is a very important aspect to these sessions. At our in-person speaker events, this exhibition is accessible at registration, break time and at the end of the day. And at the virtual events, each company will deliver short presentations and be available for questions in the chat function. Our event speakers share stories and information that are beneficial, informative and engaging for attendees. This year we are launching our first standalone in-person technology exhibitions in central locations across all four nations to further increase the opportunity to see,
feel and ask questions about these diabetes management options. As well as these standalone events, members of the community will also have access to register separately and drop into technology exhibitions at the Discovery Day speakers event also. Your voice matters. Volunteer and help shape our work to ensure it remains relevant to people living with type 1 diabetes. From reviewing content and policies to taking part in the development or support services and innovative research projects, your feedback and involvement means a lot and will help make a big difference. Our ways to get involved, involved include topics such as reviewing type 1 information and materials, commercial market research, policy development, scientific research support and service design. You can also sign up to one of our ambassador programs or come along and help out at one of our physical events. We want to thank you for joining us this evening and if you have any further queries please reach out to our community engagement team at outreach at jdrf.org.uk. Thank you. And thank you Adele for that insight around the work that JDRF does in providing community support. Um, we're now going to be joined by Medrum who produced the Touch Care Nano Pump and CGM. So welcome Medrum to the event. Thank you, Chris. Hi, everybody. Um, my name's Jane from Metrum, and um, I've got a question. Does size matter? Metrum are passionate about making diabetes a smaller part of life. This is the nano tubeless insulin pump and CGM with optional smartphone control. What Metrum brings you is more than a patch pump. Both the nano pump and CGM can be used independently. However, the magic really happens when the pump and CGM are integrated, giving peace of mind with predictive low glucose suspend function to help prevent hypoglycemia. The system is also future-proof for hybrid closed loop, which will be launched next year. Uniquely, Metrum users have the option to control their pump using either the small discrete personal diabetes manager, PDM, or a compatible smartphone, both Apple and Android. Smartphone pump control gives users greater freedom and discretion when managing diabetes. People tell us they feel more normal and more engaged with their diabetes, giving them discrete management, improved control, and less to carry, lose, or break. Whether using the phone or the PDM to control the pump, using the system is simple and easy and giving a bolus is as quick and discreet as sending a text. The tiny waterproof patch delivers up to three days of insulin and can be worn anywhere you might give an injection. The reusable pump base stores bolus commands and basal patterns and continues to deliver insulin even if separated from the controller. The Nano CGM has a small ultra thin profile it consists of a rechargeable transmitter and factory calibrated sensor with up to 14 day wear. You can set your own alarms and alerts and the CGM can be worn standalone or better still combined with a pump. With Metrim, you are dealing with just one company for all your pump and or CGM needs. We provide 24 hour support, 365 days a year with our helpline and you can request a free demo patch to try just visit our UK website. Thank you all for listening. Thank you, Jane, and thank you, Medrum, for your support tonight and the, the update there. Um, we're going to move on now to our final speaker of the evening, who is again another one of our own at JDRF. So we're going to be joined by Mary Murphy, who's going to give you an update on the ways in which you can support JDRF. So welcome, Mary. Hi, I'm Mary. I'm from the Community Engagement Team. I'm here to explain how you can get involved and support JDRF UK to help improve lives today and tomorrow by accelerating um, life-changing breakthroughs. These will help cure, prevent um, and treat type 1 diabetes and its complications and ultimately to get us to a world without type 1. There are three ways that you can get involved and support JDRF. 
first is to fundraise. This can be by creating an event yourself, like a bond sale, joining another event like running a marathon, or taking part in a JDRF fundraiser like our One Walks, Kilt Walks, or something like Climb, Swim, or Cycle for Type 1. The second way is to volunteer. We really appreciate your experience in the Insight and Experience panel, your knowledge um, on uh, the Scientific Advisory Council as a member, your expertise using a skill you have in the office or elsewhere, or of course event crew at our in-person events all over the UK. And the third way is to give. You can support JDRF through small monthly donations um, from your pay payroll or by direct debit, um, as well as the likes of legacy giving. You can support us with more substantial gifts through our patrons club. Um, but one of the fun ways you can give um, to JDRF is through our lottery. Our lottery only was created uh, a short while ago, but it's a really fun way where you can support JDRF and, and win something pretty substantial. By playing for just one pound a week, you have a chance of winning something as big as 25,000 pounds, but best of all, that you'll help make more events like this one possible and, and fund um, type one research that will change all our lives. Prizes range from as big as 25,000 all the way down to um, five entries into uh, another draw. These are some of the statistics in our recent draws. You have a one in 63 chance of winning a prize and you could join the 414 JDRF supporters who've already won so far um, and five supporters have won the 1000 prize. It's just a little example of one of our winners and um, they're just part of the community like you and I. It's really quick and easy to play. You just visit jdrf.org.uk forward slash lottery and click play now and follow the simple steps. Whatever way you wish to get involved with JDRF, there's always something that you can do and something that can help us and um, whatever one you choose thank you and good luck if it's the lottery and thank you mary for sharing some of the ways in which uh, you can support jdrf and uh, that was really useful for i'm sure many people there in thinking about how you could support us even after the event tonight so that also leads me into the thank yous for the night as we've now reached the end of our event so I just wanted to say a big thank you to everybody that has been involved tonight and has been attending it. We wouldn't be doing it without all of your support and all of your um, sort of keenness to be involved as well. So thank you for attending. We'd also like to thank all of the speakers that have given up their time and have been involved and provided such great insight and uh, presentations to you all. And as well as our tech partners who have also provided some incredible information and um, some um, support around our products that are available for diabetes throughout um, the community in diabetes technology. So thank you to our tech partners as well. Um, and just personally, a big thank you for everyone being here tonight. And if you'd like any further information about JDRF or would like to contact us, hopefully you'll be able to see that slide and our website and email address is pictured there. But thank you so much. I hope you all have a lovely rest of your evenings and yeah, we hope to see you soon.